Welcome. We're thankful that you're joining us for our March Acton Lecture Series. My name is Dan Churchwell, and I serve as the Director of Program Outreach here at the Acton Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Anthony Bradley. Dr. Bradley is Chair of the Religious and Theological Studies Program at the King's College in New York City. He also lectures widely at colleges, universities, business organizations, conferences and churches throughout the United States and abroad. His writings on religious and cultural issues are published in many newspapers and journals, and he has written and edited over 10 books, including his latest, Why Black Lives Matter, the subject for today's discussion. Please enjoy our lecture, and feel free to submit questions to the email listed on your screen, digital at acton.org, and we will try to get as many of them answered as possible after the lecture. Please enjoy Dr. Anthony Bradley, Why Black Lives Matter. Hi, my name is Anthony Bradley, and I am a professor of religious studies at the King's College in New York City, and I'm also a research fellow at the Acton Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to this Acton lecture series. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, Why Black Lives Matter, which is a discussion of my most recent book, uh, Why Black Lives Matter, African American Thriving for the 21st Century, uh, published by Cascade Books. The Black Lives Matter movement grew in response to a number of African Americans who were killed because of the actions of police. Uh, these men and women include Trayvon Martin, Renisha McBride, Eric Garner, John Crawford, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, and others. We also, of course, include uh, George Floyd to that number. According to the movement's official website at one point, it read this, that Black Lives Matter began as a call to action in response to state-sanctioned violence and anti-black racism. The website continued, our intention from the very beginning was to connect black people from all over the world who have a shared desire for justice to act together in their communities. The impetus for that commitment was and still is the rampant and deliberate violence inflict inflicted on us by the state. End of quote. Well, unlike the movements of the 1950s and 60s, particularly the civil rights movement, the Black Lives Matter movement has intentionally kept the black church on the periphery, in fact, on the far periphery of their advocacy of black flourishing. I believe this to be a profound error. By keeping God on the margins of what God desires for the human person that he created will not lead to long-term thriving. In fact, keeping what God desires for the human person on the margins is a predictor of social decline. The contributors to this particular volume would not only like to add perspective on why black lives matter, but we also want to explain why the church matters to why black lives matter. The central thesis is this, black lives matter because African Americans are made in the image of God. And black thriving is, therefore by extension, derivative of human flourishing in terms of what God desires. And that we should address those issues in ways that are consistent to that for this particular generation. <clears throat> this book first began as a continuation of a discussion that started in 2007 by Bill Cosby and Alvin Poussaint in their book, uh, come on people in response to comments that Bill Cosby made at an NAACP meeting. We believe that Black Lives Matter because God has intended for black life to do certain things in his world according to that which he desires. There are four pillars that really weave and tie these essays together, including human dignity, uh, moral human agency, moral virtue, and empowerment. And the 
overall claim is that black lives matter because of these four pillars, these four categories, human dignity, human agency, moral virtue, and empowerment. First, let me talk about human dignity. Now, black lives matter because, again, they are created by God and belong to God. According to the Westminster Confession of Faith, quote, after God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with responsible and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness, after his own image. Having the law of God written on their hearts, and the power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to liberty, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject unto change. Beside this law written in their hearts, they received the command not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over creatures. According to the Book of Concord, the Confessions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the Smaller Catechism, reads as follows, I believe that God has created me together with all that exists. God has made me and still preserves my body and soul, eyes, tears, and limbs, and senses, reason, and all mental faculties. End of quote. In the personalist tradition, Emmanuel Monnier describes the human person this way. A person is a living center of creative activity communication, and commitment who comes to know himself across the bridge of his action. Free, creative, and acting persons were to be in unity with other free, creative, acting persons to create a society in which the structures, customs, and institutions are rooted and revolved in and, and, and revolved around the person as the center. What sets Christians apart in all of their thinking about justice, is that it is grounded in a particularly Christian anthropology, namely the fact that we're made in the image and likeness of God, and this entails certain things. This includes the fact that the human person was created to think, to be creative, to produce, to cultivate. We are free to make our own choices and decisions without being forced. We enjoy beautiful things. We rest. We create we were created to be active, not passive. We have deep personal relationships. We were created for physical intimacy. We need and thrive in the context of community, and so on. God has given man dominion over the lower creatures. Man has created the human person and given them the right to use the things that God has made in nature for the glory of God and for the benefit of human of the human person, family, and community. God has a plan for humanity to have a superior role in the world, a dominant influence, a responsible service. Men and women are part of the creation and thus directly are, are directly involved in its continuous existence, development, and beautification. The human person was originally created to experience the full realization of the honor and joy and the peace of being truly human. Being a person is unique because it involves being like God, which is knowing the good. Because of this, there is a sense of privilege and responsibility. Being like God has definite spiritual components with a capacity to know and love and trust, desire, and to obey all of these in relationship to God. Being like God also includes one's capacity for the good, and to execute the will of God, the purposes of uh, virtue, and to achieve his goals for the world using the things that he has given us to use. And because of all of these attributes of the human person, the first chapter of the book is titled More Than Victims. Why? Because the primary definition of what it means to be black is not derived from past black experience with injustice in the American story. That is, the black person is victim, 
that is victim of oppression is not primarily how black identity should be defined. For example, chapter 6 addresses this specifically in terms of what it means to be a black man. This is why the church is so important in terms of forming and shaping what black identity is. It is shaped by sound catechesis. Vincent Baker argues in the very first chapter, what matters is not what the media says, not what Hollywood says, but what does God say? What matters then, in terms of black thriving, is simply this. What can we do to get more and more African Americans to experience what it means to be truly human? And by extension, then, of this dignity, this humanity, is, secondly, agency, human action. The work of Albert Badura is particularly helpful here because people are made in the image and likeness of God. People need to know and practice and activate human agency. <clears throat> that is, as Badura says, quote, to be an agent is to influence intentionally one's functioning in life circumstances. People are self-organizing, proactive, self-regulating, and self-reflecting. They are not simply onlookers of their behavior. They are contributors to their life circumstances, not just products of them. End of quote. And because of this, God gave the human person two commissions that are connected to agency. The first is the cultural commission. That is, men and women were created to exercise their royal status by ruling over, developing, and simultaneously developing the creation itself. Secondly was the social commission. That men and women were created as equal partners of God's intention to use them for good, each with equally important but different roles at times. This provides the basis of marriage and family and community and nation, and all of the human relationships that we experience in the world community of humanity. Bordeaux describes four core properties of human agency. First is intentionality. He says that people form intentions that include action plans and strategies for realizing them. Most human pursuits involve other participating agents, so there is no absolute agency. Individuals have to accommodate their self-interests if they are to achieve unity of effort within diversity. Collective endeavors require commitment to a shared intention and coordination of interdependent plans of action to realize it. And because of this, effective group performance is guided by collective intentionality. Secondly is forethought. Now, this involves the temple extension, says Bredora, of agency. Forethought includes more than future directed plans. People set, themselves, set, people set goals for themselves and anticipate likely outcomes of prospective actions to guide and motivate their efforts. A future cannot be a cause of a current behavior because it has no material existence. And this form of anticipatory self-guidance behavior is governed by visualized goals and anticipated outcomes rather than pulled by an unrealized future state. The inability to bring anticipated goals to bear on current activities promotes purposeful and foresightful behavior. When projected over a long course of time, what matters are the values, a forethoughtful perspective which provides direction and coherence and meaning to one's life. Third is self-reactiveness, says Bredura. Agents are not only planners and forethinkers, they are also self-regulators. Agency involves not only the deliberate ability to make choices and to plan actions, but also the ability to construct appropriate courses of action and to motivate and regulate their execution. This multifaceted self-directedness operates 
through self-regulatory processes in the explanatory gap to link thought to action. The fourth property is self-reflectiveness. People are not only agents of, of action, says Bedura, they are self-examiners of their own functioning. Through functional self-awareness, they reflect on their personal efficacy, the soundness of their thoughts and actions, the meaning of their pursuits, and they make corrective adjustments if necessary. The capability to reflect upon oneself and the adequacy of one's thoughts and actions is one of the things that makes humans distinctly different from other creatures. The human person, says Radur, don't operate, sorry, the human person does not operate as an autonomous agent, uh, nor is human behavior wholly determined by situational influences. Rather, human functioning is a product, he says, of a reciprocal interplay of interpersonal behavioral and environmental determinants, that we are impacted by community. Social, political, and economic systems are the product of human action. And social systems, in turn, help to organize, guide, and regulate human affairs. One of the things that will constitute thriving black life is thinking about the ways in which these four attributes of human agency are activated or the ways in which these are undermined. If, for example, self-reflection, self-reactiveness, and forethought are undermined by the injustice of Jim Crow or undermined by the soft bigotry of low expectations where someone else, a surrogate person, a surrogate decision maker, becomes a surrogate context for self-reflection, a surrogate context for the deliberate action with respect to moral decision making. If a surrogate decision making uh, apparatus or person becomes that which guides the individual, their agency is being undermined. Therefore, black Life cannot thrive unless human persons exercise and activate human action and human agency. And that can both be undermined and sabotaged by the injustice of something like slavery and Jim Crow, but it can also be undermined and sabotaged by the paternalism of big state programs which removes agency from men and women in ways that do not allow them and do not encourage them to make pro-social, proactive decisions that expand the range of both their dignity and their agency. Now, this entire book highlights the origins of black agency which began with the family, which emerged out of religious institutions, which emerged out of education, and so on. If we expect people to cultivate the habits and virtues of self-reflection and moral decision-making, and to activate those, and those sorts of institutions need to thrive. They need to be free to thrive. In the context of American history, there has been some ways in which we've undermined the institution of family, undermined the role of religious institutions, etc., which has created a deleterious amount of social consequences. So what Badur says with respect to agency is this, is that people who develop their competencies, self-regulatory skills, and enabling beliefs in their efficacy can generate a wider range of options that expand their freedom of action. 
and a more success and are more successful in realizing desired futures than those with less developed agenic resources. What Badura is simply saying here is that when the human person is not free to be truly human, when the human person is not free to exercise agency, to put into practice what it means to be truly human, their freedom to pursue opportunity and to pursue human action is reduced. In fact, those who are given more freedom to be truly human, they have a wider array of, of options. And this entire book highlights, again, the origins of those competencies and those skills of self-regulation that we find both within the context of the family and within the context of the church. And these are the sorts of things that the Black Lives Matter movement refuses to address the sorts of things that lead to internal black empowerment from the community out. And we believe that these are central to thriving black life in the 21st century. The third pillar, after dignity, after agency, is moral virtue. The third commission that was given by God to Adam and Eve in the context of Genesis 1 and 2 uh, is the commission to fellowship. This, this is a commission that expands the application of moral virtue. As image bearers of God, they were to be in fellowship with God by daily walking with God communing with God and expressing love, honor, and devotion and praise as the challenges and privileges of each day were met. Moral virtue is something that ought to be constituent to what it means to be truly human. It's concomitant to people being what God intends for them to be. And if black life is to thrive, Moral virtue must be at the center of it. So chapter 2 of this book explains why, for example, the family is important. Because the family is the birthplace of moral virtue. Strong families lead to strong moral virtue. Strong moral virtue leads to thriving. We can't have thriving black life in America without strong, thriving black families. Again, back to Albert Verdura, this is what he says, the exercise of moral agency rooted in personal standards linked to self-sanctions is an important feature of agency. It's an important feature of dignity. And the in the development of moral agency, says Rodora, individuals adopt standards of right and wrong that serve as guides and deterrents for conduct. It is this self-regulatory process where people monitor their conduct and the conditions under which those actions and conditions occur. We judge these things says Rodur, in relation to our moral standards and perceived circumstances, and then we regulate our actions by the consequences where they are applied. Human persons do these things, says Rodur, to give them satisfaction and a sense of self-worth, and they refrain from behaving in ways that violate their moral standards because such conduct will bring self condemnation. Thus, moral agency, says Redura, is exercised through the constraint of negative self-sanctions for conduct that violates one's moral standards and the support of positive self-sanctions for conduct that is faithful to one's moral standards. 
And where do these moral standards come from? Where do the moral standards emerge that regulates one's moral behavior, that regulates one's positive self-sanctions? Where do these come from? Well, they first emerge from the family. They are cultivated and shaped and expanded in the life of the church. The family and the church must be central to black moral virtue. Now, Berdura continues and explains that moral agents commit themselves to social obligations, to righteous causes, and consider the moral implications of the choices they face and accept some measure of responsibility for their actions and the consequences of their actions to other people. The activities, the types of activities that are designed as moral and their relative importance and the sanctions linked to them are culturally situated. That is, that we learn a sense of right and wrong. We learn a sense of responsibility to the community. We learn a sense of caring for the other in a context of habituated moral, moral formation. And that first community tasked with forming moral virtue is the family. Now, Pope John Paul II explains the importance of the family in this way in Familiaris Consortio in 1981. This is what Pope John Paul II says. Quote, The task of giving education is rooted in the primary vocation of married couples to participate in God's creative activity. By begetting in love and for love a new person, who has within himself or herself, or, or herself the vocation to growth and development, parents, by that very fact, take on the task of helping that person effectively to live a fully human life. As the Second Vatican Council recalled, since parents have conferred life on their children, they have a most solemn obligation to educate their offspring. Hence, parents must be acknowledged as, as first and foremost educators of their children. Their role as educators is so decisive that scarcely anything can compensate for their failure in it. For it devolves on parents to create a family atmosphere so animated with love and reverence for God and others that a well-rounded person, personal and social development will be fostered among children. Hence, the family is the first school of those social virtues which every society needs. I'll read that sentence again. The family is the first school of those social virtues which every society needs. We cannot have a thriving black life community in this country without thriving black families. Mothers and fathers and children together in a community of moral formation. So in this book, chapters 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 11 all touch on the family. What it means to be parents, how to raise boys, how do we think about nurturing the lives of girls, we talk about marriage, we're going to talk about sexuality, what, it, what it's intended for, how families can grow closer together. Because when it goes wrong, when families are broken, when marriages are broken, when children are not formed in that context, just as it is a consequence of good parenting and good formation to have an impact in the world, it is also, by extension, consequential when children are not properly formed in solid homes. I'll give you some data just as an example. Uh, for children growing up without a father, in the United States, 
there are some consequences that have a massive impact on our society. For example, 85% of youths in prison are from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. Nearly 25 million children in this country live without their biological father. 60% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. And this is why marriage and family is so important, because we know from the data that if you come from a fatherless home, if you drop out of high school, if you are, are homeless, you're much more likely to come in contact with the criminal justice system. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that the greatest antidote to our criminal justice attentions that we have in this country, our greatest antidote to what we want to consider and call mass incarceration, on the one hand, is making reforms in the criminal justice system itself. But on the other hand, the key, most powerful antidote is actually the father, is actually the family. If we want to keep kids out of the, the, the criminal justice system, if we want to keep them out of prison, we need to invest and make sure that marriage and family is strong in those communities that have high incidences of, of crime and contact with police. The family, the family is the birthplace of moral virtue. You simply cannot have thriving black life in the 21st century without thriving black families. Lastly, is empowerment. We talked about dignity. We talked about agency. We talked about moral virtue. And this last pill that weaves itself throughout the book is empowerment. Unless people believe that they can, can produce desired effects by their actions, they'll have little incentive to act or to persevere in the face of difficulties. This is a comment by Albert Berdura. That efficacy, that empowerment, is this idea that not only do I have agency, but I can actually do something good with my agency. I can act on it. I can see that it can have an effect in the world. Berdura says this, Whatever other factors serve as guides and motivators, they are rooted in the core belief that one has the power to affect change by one's actions. That empowerment is the beginning of hope. That is, if one is confined to change and slavery, one cannot have efficacy. One does not have the incentive to be motivated to act because one is in chains and therefore hopeless. By the same scenario, if one is enchained, if one is sabotaged, if one loses the motivation to act because of the bigotry of soft of, 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 of low ex expectations, where action and motivation is undermined by paternalism, you also will have hopelessness. Why should I act when I don't have to? Badura continues that efficacy beliefs affect whether individuals think optimistically or pessimistically in self-enhancing or self-debilitating ways. Such beliefs affect a person's goals and aspirations how well they motivate themselves and their perseverance. And that perseverance in the face of difficulties and adversities. Efficacy, empowerment, believes also, sorry, 
Um, efficacy and, and empowerment beliefs also shape people's outcome expectations. Whether they expect their efforts to produce favorable outcomes or adverse ones. In addition, empowerment and efficacy determine how opportunities and impediments are viewed. People of low empowerment, of low efficacy, are easily convinced of the futility of effort in the face of difficulties, in the face of challenge. They simply give up trying. Alternatively, those that have high levels of efficacy and empowerment view impediments as insurmountable by improvement by, by, by the improvement of self-regulatory skills and the effort extended by the application of perseverance. Verdura argues that they stay the course in the face of difficulties and remain resilient to adversity. Moreover, these efficacy beliefs, these empowerment beliefs, affect the quality of emotional life and vulnerability to stress and depression. Finally, empowerment and efficacy beliefs determine the choices people make at important decisional points in their life, a factor that influences choice behavior and can have profound effect in the course that one takes in his or her life. This is because the social influences operating in selective environments, says Verdure, continue to promote certain competencies, values, and lifestyles. This is the birthplace of hope. Can I see that there is a place where my dignity and my agency and my virtue can bring positive effects for myself and the world around me? Is there a place where I can become truly human? But this was the great tragedy of slavery and Jim Crow, is that it removed that hope. And one of the great tragedies of that hope being sabotaged by the sorts of, of programs that tend to, as some people argue, tie one shoes for them again and again and again. It also removes this hope. It removes this sense of efficacy because someone is doing it for me. And we cannot have black thriving. We can't have black lives mattering if there is not empowerment. And applied to economics, uh, empowerment is asking these three questions about black flourishing. First, what are the conditions that allow the greatest number of people to exercise the creative and innovative capacities that constitute the vocation of being human? Secondly, what economic conditions provide the greatest opportunity for human flourishing? Thirdly, what economic environments facilitate human persons excelling in their moral virtue by exercising free and responsible stewardship? And because economics is the study of human action in the marketplace, while moral theology is the study of the righteousness or wrongness of human action in general, the human person is central to both economics and moral theology. The claim is that black life includes both economic empowerment, political empowerment, and also the empowerment of human dignity. In order for black lives to flourish, black lives must include must be included in the networks of exchange that shape that are shaped by moral virtue. Economic empowerment through education, through entrepreneurship, these are the sorts of things that allow a dignity and agency and virtue to thrive. These are the things that infuse a sense of hope and economic empowerment through the work in person of the image of God is, in fact, constitutive to what it means to be 
truly human. And chapters 3 and chapter 7 focus on the role of education because education is a preparation for active participation in the marketplace. We can't expect thriving black life without sound education. And so within the context of the chapters of the book, uh, there's chapters on uh, strategies to increase the educational outcomes for children and the ways in which that can happen uh, in, in order to make contributions to black thriving. And these are the things that we argue that the Black Lives Matter movement leaves out. What about human dignity? What about human agency? What about moral virtue? What about empowerment? Uh, these are the sorts of things that if we apply them properly, we'll have black lives thriving and mattering, uh, not only in 2021, but in the decades and in, in centuries to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony, for that wonderful talk. Um, we really appreciate your time here at the Acton Institute. You know as well, um, you've been involved with us for years, that we like the, the conversation between, between the study of religion and liberty and virtue is at the heart of what we do. And uh, you mentioned that in the, in the talk that the main reason for writing your book is to highlight that the Black Lives Matter movement has been intentional about keeping black churches on the periphery of their advocacy for black flourishing. Is there a way to separate the cultural artifact that uh, many of us see in the, it's, it's, it's cultivated in the media of Black Lives Matter regarding the core issues you're trying to address? Is there a way to help us separate the two? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and thanks again for having me. I'm really delighted to have an opportunity to, to talk about uh, this book. And I encourage people to buy millions and millions of copies of it and give it to all their friends. Uh, you know, so so yeah, it's a great question. I think I think there's a there's a lot of confusion because the, the language is is really fluid, right? So there's there's Black Lives Matter, the org, the, the sort of organization, and there's and there's the the sort of colloquial phrase Black Lives Matter, and those are actually not the same thing. So when someone says Black Lives Matter, it doesn't necessarily mean that they. Uh, believe or espouse the w what's on the website of the Black Lives Matter organization. So, so one of the things I encourage people to do is to actually go to their website, go to the Black Lives Matter website, and just read what they say. And th and that's that's one way to to kind of tease out what people actually mean uh, by that. Uh, sometimes we'll see Black Lives Matter. This is kind of technical, but sometimes we we'll see Black Lives Matter written in, in with capital letters for the BLM. Uh, sometimes we'll see it written in lowercase letters with the BLM as well. Those are those are different things. But I, I, I sort of encourage people to actually go read, you know, for themselves what, what the Black Lives Matter advocates are saying and then go read what the rest of us are talking about. Uh, for those of us who are who, who are sort of using the phrase to sort of enter the conversation, it's not necessarily because we are associated with the organization, but we are associated with this sort of larger conversation, uh, specifically about about the ways in which black life intersects with with uh, policing, uh, which is why the organization was created in the first place. Yeah, that's very good. Um, we've had some good questions online, and if if you're still interested in uh, asking a question, please go to digital at acton.org and email your question or through the Facebook Live platform that you're uh, watching this on, you can submit a question through that platform as well. And uh, so to take an online question, this is from Seth F. He asks, what is the best way to respond to those who try to combat the phrase Black Lives Matter with the phrase All Lives Matter? Is, is there a distinction there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Seth. Thank you for asking that question. I I, I often ask a follow-up question, sort of, you know, what what makes you say that, or ask a question: Why is it that you make? Why are you making the distinction between uh, Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter? 
um, and sort of tease out what might be motivating them to make that distinction. Because you might learn, for example, that that you know they they may have particular reasons for for the, the, the distinction, and you may be assuming things about why they making why they're making that distinction uh, that that uh, uh, may not be true. So one, 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 of, one of the best ways that I've, I've heard people sort of talk about this is to make the distinction between different types of cancer. Um, is it true that all cancer matters? Yes, it is. But sometimes we talk about breast cancer. Uh, and sometimes we talk about prostate cancer. And sometimes we talk about, right, bone cancer, brain cancer. And while it's true that all lives matter and that all lives, uh, especially in a world that's broken, experiences all sorts of, uh, of brokenness and, and injustice, that in this particular case, we're talking about the, the black experience and, and in particular, the, the black experience with policing. And so there is a narrow focus on, on this conversation uh, that's sort of worthy of a particular attention because of the way that the data works itself out, particularly in low income uh, uh, inner city communities and, and urban centers. And so, yes, it's true. All lives matter. Right. Women's lives matter. Kids lives matter. We talk about abortion. Right. The the lives of, of the unborn matter. But with respect to this particular issue, just like we're going to talk about breast cancer, we want to talk about the, the, uh, the, the, in particular, the, the, the lives of, of black Americans who are the truly disadvantaged and who have uh, uh, statistically more contact with police than, than, than others. That's good. Great, great analogy on the cancer. Um, you're, you're, in your talk, you talk about this DAVE acronym, uh, Dignity, Agency, yeah. Virtue, and Empowerment. Um, and, and your idea on personalism comes out there. Uh, a question uh, from Scott online. He asks, uh, what is your evaluation of Christian Smith's book, What is a Person? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I would, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm heavily influenced by Christian Smith. I, I, I actually almost gave the definition of, of uh, what it means to be human using uh, Christian Smith's book in my talk. I, ch I chose the Emmanuel Monnier definition because it's shorter, but it essentially gets at the, the same point. But the, the, the personalist tradition, I think I'll, I can, I can say I'm a card carrying personalist. And, and Christian Smith's work has been really, really important. That book, What is a Person, is, is extremely fantastic. I, I actually love the way he frames it. And the, what I like about the way Christian Smith has framed personalism is that it's easy to enter in, into, it's, e it's easy to take his definition into an ideological discourse where there's serious tension and difference. Why is it so useful? It's so useful because no one's against the human person uh, and, and no one is, is really against people thinking about ways in which we can uh, inspire and infuse human persons with dignity and with creativity and action. We differ on how to do that and, 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 how, and what that looks like. But as a starting point, as a starting point, I've used Christian Smith's a personalist approach and particularly that book. Uh, to, to, to really advance some good conversations. He has a follow-up book uh, that's, called, that's titled uh, To Flourish or Destruct, which takes that definition of personalism and what is a person, which is like 400-something pages, and really drills down into what it looks like to confront evil and injustice in light of that personalist framework. So I recommend uh, people follow up and read that, that book as well. It's really, really excellent. Great. Uh, yeah, Christian Smith, for those of you who don't know, is a sociologist at Notre Dame, and his books are, you can widely find them, uh, What is a Person and To Flourish or Destruct. Uh, here's a, a personal question from someone that's on point. Uh, her name is Anne, and she asks, I understand the primary importance of supporting black families in order for them to thrive, but I was wondering if you have any additional advice or support for white parents raising black children in the present society. 
I believe that poses a different kind of difficulty when the parents cannot possibly understand the extent of the adversity that their own children will endure as their parents are, as they're educated and prepared in different aspects of raising black children. That's a fantastic question, and thank you so much for asking that. There's a lot of sort of uh, cross-racial adoption happening in the country right now. It's really fantastic. And if you are a parent who's sort of cross-racially adopted African-American kids, I've always, I've always advised those parents to make sure that their kids have some regular contact uh, with, with uh, adults in the black community. That could either be through church, it could be through sports, it could be through... some sort of extracurricular activity, right? Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. Um, but they, they're going to need at some point to have these conversations with some black adults. And so I think it's important for parents to find an opportunity. It could be through your own personal friendships uh, with, with African-Americans that you have in your, in your own life, but, but they're going to need some coaching on how to navigate uh, some of these spaces. It could be through a teacher you can invite someone in to have those conversations. You can put them in contact with people who, who, who have those conversations, but it's absolutely essential because what I've seen is that when those conversations don't happen and they graduate high school and are sort of thrown out, thrust out into the world and they're confronted with some challenges, they don't know what to do. And so we wanna, we wanna get them properly ready for a rough road, a, a, an imperfect road uh, ahead of them. And so parents have opportunities to do that in lots of different ways uh, when they're raising them sort of grades K to 12. That's good. Here's another, it's, it's a personal question, but it's a, it's somewhat of a difficult one. Uh, this comes from Lindsay online and she says, uh, Grand Rapids home of Acton Institute has been ranked by Forbes as one of the best cities to raise a family. Yet it has also been ranked by Forbes as the second worst mid-sized city for black households to thrive economically. This breaks my heart. This should cause us distress. What you share clearly offers big ideas that can address this. But what are tangible things that can be done? What organizations or institutions are leading well in these principles? Are they helping affect any meaningful change? That's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I, I lived in Grand Rapids for three years, and so this, this question isn't foreign to me. I saw it uh, firsthand. I was raised in Atlanta, which has a predominantly uh, uh, black professional class running the city in government, in business. And so I came to Grand Rapids and I was sort of shell-shocked by the, by the disparity. I think, I think one of the issues in Grand Rapids in particular, and you see this in lots of, in lots of uh, uh, cities across the country, is that there's a bit of a brain drain with African-Americans who are smart, intelligent, successful, professional. They tend to leave, right? They'll go to Chicago, they'll go to Detroit, right? They'll go somewhere else. And I think, I think, for cities like Grand Rapids, the, the challenge is how do you how do you keep the the sort of black professional class from leaving, right? Uh, what sort of what sort of pipelines and opportunities can various uh, nonprofit, for profit, right, uh, even government institutions provide to get people to want to stay uh, rather than go to Chicago or, or go or go uh, some, somewhere else. And so, and so, because there is some some geographic disparity in the in a great in the greater jar area, if you are a smart black kid um, who has great moral formation, you have a lots of opportunities across the country to do things. And and I guess the question is, what sorts of institutions and organizations um, can be working in high schools to pipeline really talented, smart. Uh, 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 forward thinking, kind of morally formed, virtuous uh, black men and women into networks that ca that will encourage them to stay in, in Grand Rapids. And it's got to start, it's got to start probably in the middle school, high school years, right? And that could include internships, 
right? I, I, I think I think if you want black kids to stay, if you want to see this disparity change, you're gonna have to really look for opportunities to give high school students exposure to opportunities that they can have when they get out of college, when they become adults. And, and that, that really can, can begin the process of changing some of those disparities because you need, you need some of those families to, to, to actually stay. With respect to those that, that, that are, are remaining, again, I think the sort of major barrier to some of the things are sort of the things that allow families to flourish, which are gainful employment opportunities, right? So if, if black residents in the greater GR area are just working retail and food service jobs, you're not going to see a lot of change. There's gotta be some pathway pipeline uh, into the trades and also uh, into the uh, professional class. And so work has to be done, again, to give middle school, high school students exposure to trades, uh, give them exposure to job opportunities, apprenticeships, internships, et cetera, but also give them exposure to the fact that you can be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher in Grand Rapids. You don't have to go to Chicago to be a lawyer. You can do it right there in GR. Thank you for that. And, and, and riffing off what you've talked about in, in your lecture, the black church has an opportunity. Well, churches in general have an opportunity to support that agenda as well, right? I mean, that's, that could be a natural point of uh, talking about these things. And, uh, Absolutely, I, and and it, it it would be an opportunity. It would be an opportunity for church to partner together uh, with black churches, so that the human capital, right on the on the back end, sorry on 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 the, on the front end of that, right, the people who are already working those positions can make those connections with the people they want to bring up into those into those spaces later on. For sure, um, we have time for one last question. And uh, it's a practical question as well, but this comes from online. Please share some of the educational outcome strategies that you think would contribute to black lives thriving in our country at the current moment. Is there, is there an educational outcome that would help? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Fantastic question. What the, what the data says, what the data says is that Outside of parents, the second greater, the second great, greatest predictor of, of, of educational success in college enrollment, particularly for uh, black kids on the margins, but black kids in general, is the church, is their involvement in the, in the church. Why is that? Because the black church has a tradition of celebrating education K through 16 and beyond. And so the extent to which communities support black churches and, and, and support the, the role that black churches play in celebrating education K-12, K to 12, you will be inadvertently addressing that, that, very, that, that, that very issue. Because it, the, the extent to which you support the black family, the extent to which you support black churches, those are the sort of two greatest predictors of education success and outcome for black kids. And, and the more we invest in those things, the better those outcomes will be. Well, Dr. Bradley, uh, thank you so much again for joining us, sharing your years of insight, the research from your book. Uh, we're always delighted to have you here. Thank you for uh, lecturing and talking with us today. Thanks for having me. For those of you, uh, please remember if you want to go deeper, the essays, the edited essays in this book are fantastic. So Why Black Lives Matter by Dr. Anthony Bradley. Please look for this at Amazon or anywhere else you can find good books. Uh, we also have wonderful opportunities coming up each month for these Acton Lecture Series. The next one will be uh, in April. Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson will be talking about the concept of propaganda, uh, but using Alexander Solzhenitsyn as an entryway into the conversation of propaganda. So please join us, look for these emails. Thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us at acton.org. Thank you.